Okay, so thank you for joining my talk about Flow 310. Um, I hope that for some of you this won't be too boring because there are quite a few of you who already looked into Flow 3 during the last few months. And this will be a talk about giving you some overview about the key features. Um, showing some gimmicks, you can also win something if you like to, uh, if you can answer some questions. Um, so it's full of excitement and other boring stuff. Um, if you're here for the very first time, my name is Robert Lemke. I am your host today. Um, I've been part of this community for a few years. Since recently I have a second daughter that was a very good investment. Um, it costs some sleep, but nevertheless, you get a lot of it. Uh, for example, some real-world bugs like a flu or what, whatever they carry <laughs> home. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm a really happy father and uh, still have time to develop a bit. And so I give you an overview of Flow 310 as we are going to release it uh, in two weeks from now. So, as I mentioned today in the keynote, uh, someone came up with the ter term Flow3 is a web application platform. Um, Marketing-wise, probably a nice idea, but as I said, um, somehow we need to differentiate Flow3 from the other frameworks uh, so, so you know what you can expect. Flow3 is really not the type of framework where you can just pick your favorite feature and extract it from the framework and use it standalone. Um, this is really the case with most other frameworks. Um, in Flow 3, there is object management, and we have aspect-oriented programming, security framework. All these things are really tightly working together and giving you some nice user experience while you're developing. So you cannot just um, use single parts of it. On the other hand, it's modular enough that you could backport most of the features to version 4, sometimes even before we finished programming them. For example, the command line uh, support I'm going to show you has been backported be before I finished it. <laughs> I didn't even announce it, and then it was, yeah, it was backported during the developer days, I think, or at least I heard about it, but it was far from being finished. So... Anyway, it's, it's very good that the features and the techniques we produced in Flow 3 are going back also to the version 4 branch uh, in form of XBase and, and some other core enhancement. But keep in mind that this is um, kind of half of the truth. So it's, um, you learn the new techniques and you have a lot of new ways to develop in version 4 now with XBase. Um, but it doesn't really mean that you know the whole Flow 3 experience because uh, persistence, for example, is a completely different story and uh, some, some other aspects as well. I'm not sure about this point, free and open source, LGPL version 3, and not so much about the free and open source. I think that could stay, but we're currently discussing if changing the license would help anybody. <laughs> Um, making it even more free, more available, like MIT license or whatever. So if you have some opinion about it, if uh, LGPL is a problem for you and you would like to have MIT license instead, then just uh, let us know, um, because we have some contributor license agreement, so anybody working for Flow3 has to sign that, we have the opportunity to change the license afterwards to something more liberal, for example. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the reason why we do that is not only because we love to create frameworks. Um, I mean, who created a framework himself in his life? And so the rest, you all have it ahead of you. Who, who created a CMS in his life? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not so bad. Everybody should do that. <laughs> Um, but that was not the key reason, of course. Um, 
it's type of three Phoenix. And we see that uh, we can advance very quickly with the implementation of Phoenix now that we have Flow 3. I'd like to show you some, some nice feature, um, which is uh, the comment line support. As I also mentioned in the keynote, uh, we're not only delivering the software, but also we think about how you can deploy that in the future, um, how you will actually use it in your projects. So we deliver some, some kind of whole concept. And one important thing is if you want to automatically deploy your, your software or deploy to a cloud environment, you need nice command line access. You need to be able to uh, warm up caches through the command line, etc. But also during develop, uh, development, it can be very helpful. Um, for example, you want to generate some, some demo data for your inst installation, for some testing data. That's pretty easy to do through the command line. You don't have to create some web interface for that. So the command line is just, you have a flow3 command uh, that even someone, uh, someone in our team is using Windows, you have to know. So he reported that that even works with Windows. And we have some uh, help messages. Uh, we took close attention on making this uh, look like any other Linux command, for example, and you can kickstart your own commands very easily. Uh, you just uh, create, a, um, use a package key and, and a name for the controller, and then when you call the help screen again, uh, you already see your new command, and it's very, very few lines of code you have to write in order to get your new command. Actually, it's just a method you have to write. And the documentation for uh, this help screen, for example, is extracted from the doc comment of your method. There's no additional configuration. And if you look, take a closer look at that later on, we have a tutorial which also explains uh, these parts. Then you'll realize that there are always very, very few lines of code or extremely few configuration you have to, to write. That's an important point. I also mentioned that in the keynote that uh, we, we'd like to solve something better one time and take a lot of effort into it uh, than you having to type configuration all the time again and again because that's really not fun and that's blocking you in your flow. Something I have to mention again and again is domain-driven design because it's such an important underlying principle of, of Flow 3. There are some other principles like dependency injection, which now found kind of into the mainstream of, of the PHP community. But domain-driven design is still a bit exotic because it's probably a bit harder to grasp. Um, but it's really important to, to get into that. There are some books about it I recommend every year for six years now. <laughs> Who has it? Domain-driven design. Very nice. Who read it? <laughs> Almost the same people. <laughs> um, it takes really a while getting into it, um, but the result is that you have a very clear structure of your application. Something you can discuss with your customers very easily. Some very robust application is the result. We adjusted the object handling and the persistence framework to domain-driven design. And in the beginning, we had our own persistence layer. Fortunately, we didn't have to continue with that because and the Doctrine team was working on a version 2 of their uh, ORM and DBAL. And fortunately, they, they took like the same route we were taking. It's the same ideas. But they took it a lot of steps further because they could concentrate on only that part. So they have much nicer possibilities. We switched to Doctrine beginning of this year. And that was really, yeah. <laughs> we got it started very quickly. Um, actually, Benjamin uh, Eberlei from, from the Doctrine team uh, created some patch overnight just to see how it, if it would be possible. And so the first foundations were laid. 
and uh, Carsten created something usable in January already or February. <laughs> but integrating it into Flow 3 in a way that it really feels like Flow 3, that you don't have to write duplicate configuration all the time. That took almost until now. We're still polishing some parts. Um, there's some uh, example here. Uh, that's yeah, basic persistence, like we had previously in Flow 3, is still possible. So you just create objects, you add it to a repository, and then it's persisted in the database. So when you're working with Flow 3 and Doctrine, um, you completely forget about the database and work with objects. And when you, when you are over that, you, so you really forgot the database in the background, then you may think about it again for optimization. But that's an important step because we, we are so bound to thinking in terms of tables and fields and what if, if I make this relation, then uh, I have join tables and then it will be slow. And don't, don't do that as a first step. Try to think in object-oriented way. Your application will be much nicer, and then you can optimize afterwards. Um, one important feature of Flow 3 is its object management. And one part of the object management is dependency injection. Uh, who's um, using dependency injection in some way already? That is a lot of you, that's pretty cool. It's extremely easy to use, and I hope you don't forget why you're using that, because um, it really helps you creating reusable code which doesn't depend on concrete other classes. It's extremely important to use dependency injection. And it's extremely easy to do that with Flow 3, because we have a lot of experience with that. We started um, I started with the first implementation of dependency injection in 2006. And since then, we have used that almost every day. Certainly not in real-world projects in the beginning, but still, Flow 3 is using its own framework. Um, so we were using dependency injection within Flow 3 already. And I've seen that it only really is fun working with dependency injection if the whole object management is done by, by the framework. Um, there are other frameworks where only parts of your classes support dependency injection. You need to register your classes which support dependency injection. And then you st always stumble over like, oh, is this already enabled or not? And uh, so you, you end up writing a lot of configuration again. We found a way to put this into hard-coded PHP, compile that, so it's pretty fast. Um, but at the same time, the whole object management is done for any object um, which you are using with Flow 3. Just some example. Uh, you have some Symfony code here. I'm not that uh, Symfony expert, but um, it's a, just a regular controller. So you have one dependency, a greeter service. And that should be injected through the constructor here. That's constructor injection. And then you use, in your action, you just use the greeter service. So. That is also pretty much how we use that in Flow 3. This is the basic idea of constructor injection. Now, when you use that uh, in Symfony, you need to define that the greeter service exists and what class uh, it's using for its implementation. You also need to define uh, that the demo controller is a service and that the first argument of the constructor needs a greeter service. So with that, you do all the wiring between the different services and dependencies. Who has worked on a project with more than 10 classes? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Okay, who, write, who likes to write XML a lot? <laughs> Benjamin does. Benjamin also doesn't like annotations. <laughs> um, well, I don't. Let's compare it. Um, this is the controller in Flow 3. It's pretty similar. Uh, so you got some, some injection. I forgot to add the greeter service here, but obviously you need that for the example to make sense. And this is the configuration you need in Flow 3 because you already wrote it. Yeah, you already wrote it. You used the type hint here because you're a good PHP 5.3 citizen or a good object-oriented programmer. So the framework knows that this constructor obviously needs a greeter service because there's this type hint. And if this class is instantiated and you don't pass it a constructor argument, Flow3 knows that, okay, but I better do that because otherwise this will fail. And this is called auto-wiring. That's true, so you better use a greeter service interface. Yeah. So, but um, if you use a greeter service interface, Flow3 would check, is there some implementation of the greeter interface, uh, greeter service interface in the system? And if there's only one implementation, it will just choose that, because that would be probably the right choice. If there are two, and you didn't configure which one to choose, then you get some error during compile time, before you deliver that to your client. Good point. <laughs> um, some other example, um, we have also setter injection that's also commonly used in other frameworks. So instead of the constructor, you can use inject greeter service in this case. So setter injection means that you use a setter method, of course. So it should be uh, set greeter service. But if we want to do auto-wiring, if Flow3 should recognize that this is your injection method, um, it cannot know if it's allowed to call that setter method. It could be like uh, set bank account amount, or you know, it could be dangerous setters the framework better shouldn't call. So we made the convention that if you name your method inject something, and if it has exactly one argument, which is some service, some object it knows of, then this is supposed to be an, an ejection method. And then you can be sure that as soon as the demo controller is instantiated, this method is called, and then you see <laughs> missing the greeter service again, but then it would be available immediately in your action. Now, um, as I said, in 2006, I started with it. Since then, I have written a lot of these methods. And um, certainly, your IDE can support you with some templates, and you don't have to write these methods again and again. But after all, I found even that is a lot of typing. So we came up with property injection. Um, here you got the greeter service as a property. It can be protected, private, as you like. And you use the var annotation here to document which service you need. And then you just add some inject annotation here. And that's enough for Flow3 to know that there should be a service in there. It should be injected. And it's not even slow, because in the beginning, we used uh, PHP's reflection API, because uh, this is protected. So you need to set it somehow from outside. We don't do that anymore because we have some compiling going uh, on in the background. So the resulting code for this injection is just this greeter service equals object manager get greeter service. So it's like as if you coded that yourself. It's extremely fast and it's cached. So this is nothing going on during runtime which is evaluated or something. These are the simple examples, of course. Um, if you want to inject just a concrete service like the greeter service or some customer number generator service, as I uh, showed today, there are more complex situations. 
Um, imagine you want to inject a cache. Then you need some more information. What kind of cache should that be? Should it be uh, file-based or in the database? And what exact cache do you mean? There are some other examples. You could inject a web service for Flickr, for example. Now, you need some more information, username, password, or API key, whatever. Um, and so you need to configure that object before you inject it. And for that, you still can use configuration. So this is one of the more complex examples, um, just to show you uh, what you could do. In this case, we define that there's something called RSA Wallet Service Interface. So you program against an interface and not a concrete class. In your code, you would just write inject uh, RSA Wallet Service and use the interface as a type hint. So when you re refer to that, here's the definition that the actual implementation should be this class here. That should be a singleton, so it should only exist once in the whole system, one instance in the system. And this service has a setter called uh, inject key store cache or set key store cache, depends. And Flow3 should call that setter and uh, pass it some object. And that object is not some direct object, some direct instance of another service, but it's the result of a factory method call. The factory should be the cache manager and the method called on that cache manager should be get cache. And get cache requires another argument, which is Flow3 security cryptography RSA wallet, which should be passed. And so you get the result of this whole chain injected if you only refer to this interface. Now the nice thing is that um, you have different contexts in Flow3, so you have a development context, production context, you could have a profiling context, and you can create configurations for each of these contexts and use different implementations. For sending emails, for example, you could configure your email transport uh, to send emails to your customer in the production context and the development context to your own email address. And just by switching the context, by using a different subdomain, for example, uh, you would be sure that while you're testing your application, only you get the emails. Um, I mentioned in the keynote that um, there are some challenges we, we face and things uh, we didn't think were possible. And as I said, the object management is considering all objects and the whole life cycle of the objects. I had this example also previously. Um, so again, um, I, I don't know, now that you've seen a bit more about dependency injection, this example might make more sense to you. If we instantiate the customer, then this must be injected really before we use any other method on the customer. And how we do that is by creating proxy classes so, here's a class called paper. You created a paper class for your conference. Someone can hand in the paper. What Flow3 does is it creates a copy of your class and calls it paper original. And it has exactly the same line numbers here, like your class. So, if you have an error message, uh, you will get the, the accurate line numbers. But Flow3 extends this original class and calls it paper. So when you type new paper, you get an instance of this class here and not your own class. And by this mechanism and some auto-loading uh, auto magic, we are able to just use a different class in, in the real runtime. And of course, add all the magic we want into the construct, wake up methods, etc. Um, this is extremely helpful in lots of situations you won't uh, think of immediately. Imagine you have uh, some, some shop, you have some 
items you can buy there, some articles. And each article has certain objects which are attached to it, um, probably some, some uh, t-shirt size, and et cetera, colors, et cetera. But also rely on certain services, maybe some thumbnail service to display um, the article. Now, if you put such an object into a shopping basket, into a session, what would happen technically? You would serialize that article object. And if you serialize an object in PHP, it will follow all the dependencies. So eventually, you would serialize Flow3 and put it into your session. Very nice. Now, because we have this, this proxy classes, we can create our own wake up and sleep methods, which make sure that everything which are dependencies, only services, they will be cut off, and the real objects containing data will be left. And then you serialize everything, put that into your session, and when you unserialize it again, Flow3 knows that there are dependencies which need to be re-injected. So you just call unserialize again, and then you get the whole object with all dependencies back again. So from a developer's perspective, it's extremely easy using it. Um, one note I'd, I'd like to mention, uh, one feature of Doctrine I'm, I'm really happy about is migrations. Um, because um, I'm such a fan of, of this whole automatic deployment, continuous delivery, cloud stuff. And when you do that, when you automize your deployments, then you need to be sure that everything works fine. And if, if it doesn't, you need the possibility to roll back during the deployment. If something goes wrong, you don't want a half-finished release on your live web server. And Doctrine Migrations allows you to create little scripts, which are, it generates some, some, some initial script for you, which does all the database structure changes. And not only the new version, but also the version, how you can get back to a previous version. So there's always an up and a down migration. And this allows you to do something like, I have a model with uh, a person, and it has a property called name. Now, after a while, I realized that this was a stupid idea, because it would be bad at being able to distinguish between first name and last name. So I can create some migration. I, I create two new properties, first name and last name. And then, in my migration, I add some additional code which takes all the existing data, parses the names, and puts it into the new first name and last name properties. And now, when I deploy my application, this migration will be executed automatically, and all the data will be migrated. And that also works backward when you provide the code that you could also merge first name, last name again to just the name property and that would work fine. Right, um, another key feature. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> another key feature I'd like to mention um, is, is the security framework. This is really sophisticated. We are lacking a bit the user interface for that. It's because it's quite complex and, and behind the scenes. But it allows, it allows you to do uh, all the things like authentication, authorization in, in various kinds, validation, filtering. We have a firewall. We have different um, ways of uh, content security also. So basically, what you can do is authenticate in different ways, like by username, password, by some API key, if you like, some LDAP authentication, whatever. You can log in with multiple accounts at the same time. Now, why does that make sense? In Type 3 context, that makes a lot of sense, because you can log in 
into the back end and with a different account into the front end at the same time. You can also um, have writes which build on, on each other. So if you're logged in with two accounts, then you have even more writes. So you better log in with 500 accounts, and then you could do everything. Um, authorization is done directly in your code. So if you have some action and don't want someone to call the delete action, Flow3 will automatically insert some code in this proxy class, which intercepts method calls. You don't have to write security code anymore. You just control it from a central place. Um, this is done through aspect-oriented programming. As far as I know, uh, Flow3 is the only framework in PHP which really uh, thinks that that should be used and this makes it possible in a nice way. I've demoed that yesterday and it even worked. <laughs> um, it's really powerful uh, not only for creating, for solving these cross-cutting concerns like security, but it also helps you debugging and profiling your application. With AOP, you can do things like um, every time I, I call a method with a certain name or within a certain area of my application, please call this code. And you can modify the arguments which are passed to that original method. So you can intercept other code without <coughs> touching it, really. That even works for third-party code. So you can use the Symfony component or Zend Framework component, put it into Flow3. We're doing that with Doctrine, actually. Doctrine is just uh, a Flow3 package without really modifications on the original Doctrine code. We can use aspect-oriented programming to modify the behavior of Doctrine, although that probably wouldn't be a good idea. But imagine you have some code you want to use, but you do, and, and you have a few things you need to change, but you don't want to touch the original code because you, don't, you want to have that upgrade option. That's something you can do with AOP. So internally, we use that for the whole persistence part, for logging, debugging mostly, and security. Um, okay, before I come to the roadmap, I, I think I said uh, that you could win something. So who owned and who was at the tutorial yesterday? That was a stupid idea to come again because you know everything already, but I appreciate it a lot. Thanks. Um, who owns a C64? Oh, not bad. Who owned a C64 in his life? That's a lot. Cool. So what is the command on a C64 to reboot? And we had guys yesterday, yeah, I had a final cartridge. I only had to press the button. <laughs> you know that? Sorry? No, it's the sys command. Do you know that sys command? I couldn't forget. I, I, I really... Why is it just me that I cannot forget this number? Sorry? Where was that? With that? That's right. You won a T-shirt. Uh, well, the T-shirt. Yeah, cool. You won a T-shirt. So let's see. Uh, we have some C64 support in Flow 3. Should I share that with you? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, obviously, if you look into the uh, help, it won't appear there. I have my coffee example here still, which reminds me of coffee. But um, you, you have that situation that sometimes you need to flush the cache, right? Um, Actually, in Type 3 Phoenix, we don't plan to have that clear all caches button anymore because that should happen automatically. But still, um, sometimes <laughs> you just want the whole system to reboot. <laughs> so.
So there are a lot more Easter eggs in Flow 3. So if you really get into the code, you'll discover some things. Um, yeah. Let's see if we come, come up with some new emulation next time. Now you know the shortcut. OK. Um, thanks. Uh, the roadmap. <laughs> the roadmap. We have a public roadmap, although most of you don't know, and we actually maintain that. Um, you won't see something like, what are you going to do in five years from now? Um, but things like, uh, what is planned for the next version? And it might change a little, and we don't promise a lot, but some things. Um, so this is the, the place where you find the roadmap. And as I mentioned, uh, we plan to f uh, release Flow 3.1.0 in two weeks from now, about two weeks from now. Um, because it is now used in some, some nice projects. And I hope you watch the talks. I'm also very curious about the results of the real-world experience with Flow3. Um, also, as I said, speed is something we have on our to-do for version 1.1. We're doing some profiling. We have some, some plans to rewrite the reflection service, which is a big uh, speed problem at the moment, but still it's um, totally okay to run a conference website. <laughs> and speaking of the conference website, if you want to go into Flow3, why not just download the conference website? We have all the source code from our conference management system, Phoenix-based, um, at Git. Just download it, install it on your computer, and uh, take a look at the uh, code examples. Some uh, probably were made in a hurry, certainly. But um, still, there's a lot you can discover. My personal blog is also going to change. Um, it's still, I'm, I'm this brave guy uh, using Flow 3 for years now for my blog. And uh, I'll transform that to a Phoenix website because, uh, as you've seen um, in, in the keynote, we now have a user interface which really makes it fun to, to maintain a website. We have a quick start tutorial, which is qu quite new. Um, and we are improving gradually the documentation. Also, um, uh, we plan to create a completely new website. And um, it's a bit, yeah, we, we see, we'll see how, how much time that will take. But um, we hope to have that out soon. And you'll have some very nice um, Phoenix website with documentation of Flow 3 rendered. Right, so would there be any questions <laughs> or any answers you can give me? Who, who plans to uh, use Flow3 this year for some real project? <laughs> some hands go down again. <laughs> <laughs> no, again, who, who plans, considers uh, Flow3 for a real project this year? That's about 100% more than last time I asked at the conference. <laughs> this is, it's really cool. Um, I'm honestly uh, a bit surprised again and again when I see in the, in the Flow3 IRC channel uh, people like, yeah, and uh, in this customer project I'm currently working on, we have this and that, and people are actually using it. That's pretty cool. And um, keep in mind, if you're one of the first 300 users, you get that. Uh, priority support by us. Uh, we'd really like to, to see happy users in the beginning and after that as well. <laughs> and if you have any questions or suggestions, uh, just get in touch with me and I hope uh, that you like it as we do. So, thank you.